And welcome back to another episode of We Are Being Transformed. I am joined this evening again by the esteemable Dr. Timothy Whitmarsh. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Jason. Thanks for having me on the show. Welcome. Always a pleasure to have you on. Um, so last time we had a fantastic discussion about the Greek novel, the matrix in which it was created, um, what made it so appealing. Uh, you gave a fa fabulous overview of that. Um, in this discussion, I wanted to uh, selfishly go over my favorite of the five, um, that is Achilles Tatius's uh, Leucopian Clitophon. Uh, so briefly, who was Achilles Tatius? Uh, why is Leucopian Clitophon so significant, especially when juxtaposed against the other texts in its uh, genre? It sounds like that's a question for you. <laughs> it's your fav favorite one, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. And then perhaps you can tell me why it's your favorite one. Uh, Achilles Tatius was a second century AD um, Egyptian from Alexandria. As far as we know, he's a, a figure. We, unlike the other novelists, we, we think we know a little bit about him. There's, uh, uh, he, we know of the titles, at least, of some of the other texts that he wrote, including a work on uh, astronomy. And he's also said to have written on uh, um, on etymology as well. So he seems to have been an educated Alexandrian, Alexandria being a great intellectual capital uh, founded by Alexander the Great and the site of, of course, the Alexandrian Library and the like. So he seems to be breathing that atmosphere, that sort of highly intellectualized, recondite atmosphere. Um, I reckon he was writing in the 130s. Uh, other people think he was writing in the 170s, um, but I'd rather put him in the time of the Emperor Hadrian. I think it sort of s s breathes the the air of the Emperor Hadrian, if you like. So uh, Leucippe and Clytophon is a novel written in eight books. Uh, it's what I would call a second wave novel. I think the first wave it occurs in the, the first century when we get these uh, two texts, Caritone and Xenophon of Ephesus, write these... Um, texts which share a lot with each other. They're both written from a detached perspective. The narrator takes a step back and um, describes what happens to his characters as they go through. And in both texts, the characters meet and fall in love at the beginning, and there are all sorts of similarities between the way in which they, they do that in both texts. Um, but then they get married, and then they get separated, and then they, they re-establish their marriage at the end. What we get in the second wave text of the second century um, is a very much more, at the same time, a, a much more sort of personal, dynamic, direct approach to the novel. Um, so in Achilles Tatius, it's a first-person romance. It's told from the point of view, mostly, of this figure, Clytophon, and it gives it a sort of visceral edge. Uh, it's very much about... Um, the desire of one individual uh, and it's male a male individual and it's very androcentric as well although there, you know there are ways in which one can see the subversion of that androcentrism coming in as well so it, in a sense it's much more punchy and powerful and much more much less idealizing much more gritty but at the same time it's also got this very strongly what i call a mediated quality to it um that's to say you start out with a frame at the beginning where an unnamed narrator, you know, who I think we're encouraged to think is Achilles Tatius himself, turns up in the Phoenician city of Sidon, sees a painting, uh, and it's a painting of Europa being abducted by uh, Zeus in the guise of a bull, and ponders this painting, and then he's approached by a young man, and they, the two of them talk about the power of love. And that leads the young man into his narrative about his own experiences in the world of Eros, desire. And that becomes the, the, the first person narration. So whilst we do have this punchy first person narration, we've got this way in which it's sort of mediated through the figure of this narrator, who's also a sort of bit of an art expert looking at this, this painting. So it, it's got that level of intermediality to it as well. It's, we're thinking about art as a sort of equivalent to narrative and it's a very very sort of erudite text very sculpted text Achilles Tatius despite having this um, 
uh, say this sort of energetic uh, eroticism to it. It goes into some very highfalutin moments. It's full of allusions to earlier Greek literature, and it's it's got a sort of encyclopedic quality to it. I mean, it, in in the course of things, we hear about um, different breeds of cows. <laughs> we hear about um, magnetism, for example, the phenomenon of magnetism. We hear about grafting techniques and the like. So it's got this sort of, um, uh, as I say, sort of feel of a universal encyclopedia shoehorned into the, um, the genre of the Greek novel. It really is like a, a flora legium in a way. It's, it, I, I really, when I read it, I really see it as like Achilles Tatius, like um, just as a product of Paideia, like he's flexing. <laughs> like, let me show you what I know about stuff. Um, yeah, that's maybe a crude way to put it, but that's how I like to kind of see it. Um, I think getting back to what your question, I know it was more like a kind of an off, uh, offhanded remark in terms of like, why do I like it? But I think why, why I like it is this, what you were talking about, the subversive the subversive kind of um, overall feeling of it. It's a, uh, it's a text that's very uh, like, like when I read Mark, if Mark, if the gospels are byway and Mark is the most subversive byway, then of the Greek novels, Achilles Tatius is creating the most subversive of the Greek novel. Like I love that intertextuality and I love this uh, concept of uh it's kind of like when you watch a movie from the 1930s and then you watch a movie from like now trying to be like a movie from the 1930s and they're throwing on all the illusions and they're playing with your expectations. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing there. That's why I love it. Um, it's just everything about it is so electric. And so, you know, every expectation you could possibly have. Uh, we were talking about Sophrosyne and the lovers devotion to each other. And Achilles Tatius just totally turns that on its head. Like, yes through towards the end of the story but you know the, the the narrator is so dense that he doesn't really realize that oh he's 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 still okay you know i'm, I'm still good um but you know just getting to identity here um like a lot of the other novels um this is kind of like you know a geography you know geographically luca and clitifon takes place around the mediterranean but it's main protagonist the flavors that it ultimately portrays are Phoenician. Uh, you mentioned something called a Phoenicia, uh, or how, I can't pronounce that. Ph Phoenicica. 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 Yeah. yeah, so what is the significance of Leucopy and Clitophon as a paradigm of a Phoenicica? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I mentioned that he's from Alexandria. Um, Phoenicia is um, what we call Lebanon now. So it's a Semitic speaking uh, uh it's they speak a semitic language phoenician um so in a sense it's a it's a different um kind of cultural paradigm to both egyptian culture and to, to greek culture so how much of that achilles Tatius himself actually understood is not clear some people think that there is a real really sort of deep saturation in phoenician culture I tend to think that Achilles probably knew a bit about uh, Phoenician culture. There are there are there are moments where he he seems to know, for example, the foundation myth of the city of Tyre, for example, which um, is not widely known in Greco Egyptian culture. So I think he has some familiarity with it, but I don't think he necessarily um, has the most uh, you know sort of. Um, rich, profound understanding of the nature of, of Phoenician culture, but I think he he likes the idea that he's setting this text in the margins of the Greek-speaking world. I think he likes the idea that um, Phoenician culture has its own distinctive cultural dynamic and energy, uh, which is hinted at in the corners of the sort of penumbra of the vision of the the novel. By and large, the novel operates in a um, Greek-speaking community that uh, is fairly homogeneous across the Mediterranean world, uh, at least as it's presented in the, in the novel. Um, so he will rock up in all sorts of places. I mean, they do end up in Egypt after a while, and they talk to people who are purportedly Egyptian there, uh, but speak Greek, and they all of their cultural reference points are Greeks. All the gods that they talk about are Greek and the like. Um, again, he ends up in Asia Minor, Anatolia, modern Turkey, in Ephesus, uh, and there's 
um, no reference really to anything other than Greek culture there. So you get the sense of a sort of um, a pan-Mediterranean elite who can all speak to each other. But in the, as I say, in the margins of your of your view, you get a sense of what local cultures are doing and the very distinctiveness of those uh, individual local cultures. But it's only really sort of hinted at. I mean, the novel is has a kind of tunnel vision that comes with this first person narrator who, as you said, I mean, he's a he's a, a very strongly characterized individual. He's um, by turns feckless, desirous selfish um you know he, he's not entirely awful um but he he has all of these quite he only sees what he wants to see and i think the the author allows us to see a little bit more in the margins of of our um uh, vista if you like um and that includes the local color from phoenicia it's an exaggeration but i always like to say Clodophon is just the worst. I mean, he, he cries when his girlfriend gets chopped up, right? But ultimately, he's pretty selfish and self-centered. He projects a lot onto Wikipedia. Like, all that all that stuff that he's doing during the dinner party, and he's like, oh, my eyes are, my eyes were my meat. You know, her her beauty was my meat and all that stuff. And mm. I think going through your commentary on um, books one and two of Wikipedia and Clodophon, it really brings home that, you know, Clitophon is a self-centered, classic, unreliable narrator. It's almost like um, ahead of its time in a way. Um, yes, I'd say he's it, projecting a lot. Yeah, but how much Achilles Tatia is meant by that in my discussions with other scholars, um, it's debatable. You know, I almost see, like like you were saying, the margin, like Achilles Tatia has this unreliable narrator who only sees what he wants to see, right? But along the margins, you see the real heroes and heroines, right? So for me, when I read this text, I almost see Satyrus, Menelaus, Clinius as the true mm. protagonist of this story. They're always bailing him out. They're always actually getting stuff done. Even Melite, to, to a certain extent, she's very independent for a character in these novels at this time. She's a very uh, multi-dimensional character. And that's what I really love about it. But yeah, uh, Clitophon is basically, I don't know if you've ever seen Big Trouble in Little China, but um <laughs> sorry. There's a that was fine. There's a character played by Kurt Russell. His name's Jack Burden, and he's supposedly the main character, but he's he's basically like this guy who thinks he's the hero, but he isn't, because everybody around him is actually doing stuff and, and getting stuff done and beating up the bad guys and, and rescuing the girl, but he's just kind of always getting himself into trouble yes. and having to be bailed out. So, you know, it's it's really what I uh what I saw here, and you, you discussed that pretty well. Um, I think I wanted yes. to get back to lucky that I was wearing my unreliable narrator T-shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, yes, yeah. Those are those are the best kinds for sure. The unreliable narrators. Um, I think you touched upon that pretty well. So I actually wanted to get to my next question, which you touched upon, which is just Lucapi and Clitophon is like almost like an encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that really struck out to me was in book two, uh, where Chirophon and uh, Sostratus are solving that Kresmu, you know, that um, that that puzzle. Yeah. And and then you know, Chirophon starts explore exploring these natural marvels, like the river in Spain that sings like a lyre, so beautiful. Um, so, what would be the reason for Achilles Tatius putting these topographical paradox paradoxographies in his uh, in his text? Part of it is to do with the encyclopedic ambitions of the text as a whole that I mentioned. I mean, it is an ambitious text. It's a text that in some ways um, tries to offer an all encompassing theory, um, which is quite odd given that, as we were saying, we've it's largely narrated by this feckless individual who um, is not really a sort of theoretical figure, but um, but there are theoretical statements in the novel or statements that can be read as theoretical to do with the universal power of love and the interconnectedness of the whole of existence through um, the stewardship of, of love, of arrows uh, overhanging all of this. So whilst the text doesn't really hang together as a, um, it's not a stoic theory of the interconnectedness of everything. It's not, it's not theoretical in that sense. I think the ways in which it, it it tries to bring in aspects of everything are 
pointing towards a, if you like, a sort of, a, um, you know, a jumbled mosaic. Um, it's not a complete mosaic with all the pieces in the right place, but it's it's trying to speak with that language of, of you know, th there being a, a possible theory underlying all of this, but it's ironized, it's mediated, it's not, it's not, it's not fully resolved into a, a, a clear vision. So I think there's something of that, and there's quite a lot of encyclopedism knocking around in this time. I and mean, this is we're we're talking, you know, not long after Pliny's Natural History, for example, one of the biggest encyclopedias of of um, antiquity. And around this time, also, we get a sort of aesthetics of fragmentation in a certain amount of literature. So um, Achilles is roughly contemporary with Aulus Gellius, who writes this huge sort of encyclopedic tract on, um, I mean, sort of Latin literary culture, in effect. But he does it in this very sort of sprawling, unresolved way. A little bit later, a Christian author, Clement of Alexandria, does a similar sort of thing with, with it as a sort of compendium of all the clever things that people have said and how it fits into Christian theology, but again, sort of celebrates the asystematic nature of it. So I think Achilles is, is participating in that sort of aesthetics of encyclopedic fragmentar um, fr uh, fragmentariness. Um, he, he, he really is an author that, uh, much like Lucian, who's one of my absolute favorites, Lucian of Samosata, he, he really revels in playing with all these different motifs and all these different genres and and he revels in like not giving you a complete answer like he, yeah like you said yeah. the asystematic kind of way in which he makes his text is just really beautiful to me um my last question is going to touch upon a more serious matter but it's something that all the greek novels touch upon in one way or another um Leucope and clitophon does it quite poignantly um so when i look at this text i'm seeing uh, just not just the text, but when I look at the founding myths of Rome, for example, and the maps of Roman imperial power, uh, there's a very troubling sexual assault narrative that we find, you know, especially in things like the founding of Rome, the Sabine women. Um, even in, in this text, you see Clitophon finding the stories of Apollo and Daphne and Zeus and uh, mm -hmm. Europa very stimulating, very dark undertone. You have these unsettling aspects of these narratives um, seething under the surface. So I was wondering, and, as, and also going to the aspect of uh, the slavery, be, people are constantly being trafficked in these texts mm -hmm. and there's lots of subversions of roles. It especially happens with uh, Leucope when she has her, her head shaved and, you know, she's like mm -hmm. a Thracian slave. Um, and just the ways in which these people are um, dealing with these issues, it seems to be like an unfortunately everyday occurrence to, to them. So yeah. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this problematic issue. Yeah, well, in in a way, they are witnesses, as you say, to the culture and the conventions of their time. But there's something more to it than that when you were talking about people actively reveling in you know, taking erotic pleasure in stories of, as, as you say, sort of uh, erotic pursuits and sexual violence, uh, that does suggest that there is a sort of a, a, a way in which a reader might be encouraged to gravitate towards that subject position and to enjoy similar forms of, of gratification. And that is, as you say, it's deeply troubling. And this is, you know, part of the reason why Ovid's Metamorphosis, for example, is such a problematic text and people have been very... And it's you know it's not super clear whether we should be teaching it in universities these days um i don't don't want to get into that but you know there are strong arguments on both sides uh achilles tatius is i think a slightly different kind of text to that i mean there are as you say he does um say that he was turned on by the story of apollo's pursuit of daphne um, but soon after that, there's a discussion about erotic protocols, which is um, problematic in its own ways. But one of the things that Clytophon is told very clearly is that you mustn't use any kind of force. Uh, persuasion and seduction are fine. Um, but uh, you know, if you see any resistance, you, you should pull back. Now, when he puts that into practice, it gets a little bit icky again, because there's one point where he believes that, she, he's, that he's having a kiss with her. Um, and she seems to resist, but and he reads that as, um, you know, playful resistance. 
but of course we don't get her perspective on this and this is where the monomaniacal tunnel vision view of the the narrator becomes really problematic now i think you can sort of there are ways of reading that as exposing the um you know the the brutality of male desire and male self-deception male delusion if you like um, men trying to read the intentions of women and not doing it very successfully i think um there are there are good reasons to think that achilles is pushing us in that direction but it, at the same time you can imagine readers missing that as well so i think it is for all sorts of reasons i think this is a, a text that speaks to a lot of the issues that we face today um it speaks obviously using a different language not just um, Greek, but a different cultural language. Um, but it is grappling with these issues, uh, and it um, it's troubling. And there's no easy way of of describing or talking about these issues. Um, but as I say, I I, th I think Achilles is alive to um, some of these sorts of issues that we are talking about today. Like things like the Nag Hammadi texts. Uh, the Greek novels, um, New Testament literature, they're all dealing with, like you said in a previous interview, space. They're trying to reconceptualize people in that space using the motifs and the mores, but also trying to give different maybe results and maybe new maps of how people should interact with that world. The like text found in Nag Hammadi, like on the exegesis of the soul, will deal with the troubling aspects of human trafficking and try to present a more uh, equal way between men and women to come to terms with the world uh, using that metaphysical theological language. Um, things like the Greek novel uh, do the same thing. Like they, they take these concepts of slavery, Roman imperial rhetoric, uh, they use them, but then they give vastly different answers at times mm -hmm. to how people should um, <clears throat> respond to that world and um, well i think what you just said is is absolutely right i think when it comes to enslavement the novels uh like um the odyssey which is their parent text in all sorts of ways they do talk about the central characters often going through the experience of enslavement and in a way that does that does have a sort of humanizing effect i mean it means that readers will uh, who um, may not have been enslaved themselves may have been enslaved but may not have been enslaved themselves come to see what the world looks like from the position of the less fortunate now of course they resolve themselves happily in the end so um, no no romance finishes with the lovers still enslaved and they're rather casual in their use of uh, metaphors of slavery i mean you know a slave to love they say that kind of thing um and there are um, signs of, I mean, particularly in Achilles Tatius, there are signs of a sort of callous disregard of, of slaves, whilst there are also signs of respect towards slaves. So they're not sort of straightforward, um, and they do describe a world in which attitudes towards slaves are very, very you know, repugnant from our, our perspective. But I think this, um, this idea that what the novels try to do is give you a a very multifaceted portrait of life, including life from below, is part of the the way in which they're really fascinating social documents that do uh, belong to their time, but also, in a sense, sort of analyze their time as well.